I'm Dave Smart. The purpose of this video is to introduce you to the full range of products that Columbia has to offer and to give you a better understanding of which lane conditions they were designed for. We'll start off by reviewing what I feel are the five most important characteristics of any bowling ball. In today's world of ball drilling, it is quite easy to get confused about the many different options you have to change or improve ball reaction. So it is important that we put these drilling options in the proper perspective. We will then go into an in-depth discussion of six balls in Columbia's line. This will help you to gain a better understanding of which balls to choose when trying to get a desired reaction. Next, we will use these six balls with ten different drilling patterns designed to cover a full range of lane conditions. We will then take these same balls to the lanes and with the help of bowling great Marshall Holman, demonstrate how each one of these drilling patterns react on a wide variety of lane conditions. Following the demonstration, we will narrow down the 10 ball arsenal to a four ball package, suited for not only the toughest conditions, but the easiest of house shots as well. Finally, we will sum up everything covered in this video and point out some basic keys to remember when drilling your next ball. So let's get started. Hi, I'm Marshall Holman. I've been bowling on tour since 1974. The majority of that time, I've done things pretty much on my own and kind of been a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants kind of bowler, not really into the technical side of the game. And that worked very well for the first 15, 16, 17 years. But now with the new reactive urethane bowling balls, I need that added edge. The most important thing in today's bowling is having the right ball. Now, in order to get that right ball for me, I need a little help. So I asked Dave Smart what he feels will be the best ball in my hand for that particular condition. And that might mean drilling a new ball for a night block. You know, just because something worked in the morning, you might need something different at night. So Dave helps me out a lot. I really need an extra set of eyes to help me get the right type of reaction down the lane. The game has evolved, and I've had to evolve with it. Now what I do now is I ask Dave Smart what he thinks is the right kind of ball for me to throw, whether he thinks I should go with an axis-weighted ball or a leverage-weighted ball. It's kind of like driving a car. I can still drive a car as good as I ever could, but I can't work on a car. And it's the same thing with a bowling ball. I know how to throw a bowling ball, but I'm not sure the proper way of how to weight a bowling ball or to drill a bowling ball. So Dave helps out a lot. Hi, I'm David Ozio. I've been bowling on the Professional Bowlers Tour for 16 years. A lot of things have changed over the course of that 16 years with the manufacturers, with the companies, uh, with the balls that have come out. About six years ago, Dave Smart came out on tour and started drilling balls for PBSC. And I got to know him pretty good and found out that he was a pretty likable guy, besides the fact that he was a dadgum good ball driller. And over the course of that time, he was like a information sponge. He soaked up everything that he could possibly learn about the game of bowling, about ball drilling, about techniques, and that broadened into a horizon of learning what the ball weights, the ball surfaces, uh, all the sidelines of the game, uh, which is what I consider to be the expert side entailed. And uh, he got so knowledgeable at it that he began recommending to the players what they should do with their equipment on a week-in, week-out basis. He spent actually most of his time working with the players than he actually did ball drilling. There was times where he was in there from 1, 2 o'clock in the morning drilling balls. And so uh, it was a pretty uh, grueling job, but uh, he handled it with the utmost grace. One certain instance that sticks out in my mind was just recently in, at a tournament this winter where I got into a situation where I just got totally lost and didn't know what to do. And he came up and he said, uh, you need to try this right now because that's what the rest of the players are doing. And they were covering a lot of boards on the lane, so that's what I did. I moved in used some of my ability that God's given me and started circling the ball and lo and behold made the TV show. All the players on Team Columbia look for him, look up to him and really take his decisions in stride in order to help them to be the players that they're qualified to be out here. Uh, a lot of us already know what to do with our equipment out there but there's times when we just don't make the proper decisions and he comes up and says listen this is going to work. I believe it in my heart and I think that's the one thing that I like the most about him is the fact that he tells you straight from the heart. He's not going to baloney you. He's not going to tell you a side story. He's going to tell you exactly what he knows and what he means. And I trust that. And I think that's what um, is the bottom line to being a true professional is not being so narrow-minded that you know the most or you're the greatest because uh, there's no such person on this earth. I'll take information from anybody at any given time and use it, you know, to further my career. And having a guy on my team like that, well, it's a great asset for me.
I would like to begin with the factors that are most important in getting a proper ball reaction. The factor that has the most influence on a ball's reaction is its cover stock. Cover stock, by definition, is the chemical composition of the outer shell. There are three main types of cover stock used in today's game. First, we have reactive urethane. The general characteristics of a reactive ball is more reaction on the back end of the lane, which enhances the ball's hitting power. Overall, this cover stock has become the ideal choice for most of today's lane conditions. Then you have conventional or non-reactive urethane. This cover stock, being the dominant choice of the 80s, has since been overwhelmed by the reactive ball. On the majority of today's conditions, reactive balls seem to outperform non-reactive balls. They can still be very effective on wet-dry conditions or those times when reactive balls are simply just too hard to control. And last but not least is a polyester cover stock. Although perceived to be outdated, it can play a significant role in a player's arsenal, especially when competing on dry lane conditions. It also makes a great spare ball. The proper selection of a cover stock is important, and equally important is its surface. So let's discuss some different surfaces and their applications. First, when applying a different surface to a ball, I recommend you use the following items. A ball spinner, similar to the one I have here, several different grits of wet dry sandpaper, and a polish or compound of your choice. There are many different polishes available on today's market, so choose the one you like best. Now in changing a ball's surface, here are the methods I use. When changing a dull, high friction surface to a polished, low friction state, I first start with a wet 400 grit sandpaper, sanding the ball with its label up, covering the whole top half of the ball, then turning the ball over so the label is down, again completely covering that half of the ball. Do the same procedure with 600 grit sandpaper and 1000 grit paper. What this does is smooths the surface out, making it easier to polish. After sanding, apply the polish you have chosen, using the same method as when sanding, label up and label down. This simple procedure will bring a dull ball to a good polish. Now, to make a polish ball dull, simply take a 320 grit sandpaper to the surface. 320 grit is the surface you will find on all of Columbia's out-of-the-box dull balls. Bear in mind, there are many times when dull can be too dull and a polished ball may go too straight. In this case, apply a medium friction surface to the ball, such as a 400 or a 600 grit sandpaper. Always look first at altering a ball's surface when trying to change the way it reacts in the lane. Watch this demonstration to prove this point. Dave, that's close, but I just think it's snapping too hard in the back end. Is there something you can do to help me tame that down a little bit? I see what you mean. I think actually the ball hooking too much down the lane is a result of it being too shiny. I think maybe if we take a scuff pad to the track and sand it down a little bit, it'll cause the ball to burn up its energy sooner, which will result in a smoother back end reaction. I'll well, we give it a try. All right. Should result in a smoother reaction down the lane. All right, I'll give it a shot. Just as cover stocks and surface go hand in hand, so do core configuration and pin position. Although not nearly as important as cover stock and ball surface, these two components can greatly enhance the player's ball reaction, if used properly. Let's look at three different types of core configurations. First we have here a three-piece ball. It consists of a round core and a denser pancake on top, surrounded by a thin outer shell. This ball is referred to as having a high center of gravity which means the dense part of the core is close to the outer shell. The shadow R we'll be using today is an example of a three-piece ball. Secondly, we have several examples of a two-piece ball, the two pieces being the dense inner core and the outer cover stock. Since the denser core is more towards the center of the ball, this core is referred to as having a low center of gravity. The Power Torque, Beast, and Blue Beast are all two-piece balls. And now we have the Piranha and Stingray, which are considered to have modified two-piece cores. It is given the name modified because unlike the two-piece core, this core has multiple densities. These components are poured in separate molds 
and then adhered together with epoxy. For the most part, the center of gravity in a modified two-piece core falls between a three-piece ball and most two-piece balls. We will go through the performance characteristics of all these different balls later on in the video. Now let's talk about pin position. When discussing pin position, you must realize it really has two meanings. One, it's position relative to the CG, or center of gravity of the ball. Two, it's position relative to the grip center when laying out the ball. So let's first talk about the pin relative to the CG. Through the ongoing learning process the manufacturers go through when making a bowling ball, they have learned that by shifting the core in the ball, you move the center of gravity away from the pin, thus creating a pin-out ball. I have here in front of me a pin-in ball and a pin-out ball. As you can see, the CG in this ball is directly above the pin. This is a result of the core sitting in the middle of the ball, thus noted by the distance between the edge of the core and the outer shell of the ball being equal. On the other hand, in this pin-out ball, the core is shifted and doesn't sit in the center of the ball, moving the CG in the direction the core was shifted. The CG in this ball falls five inches from the pin, resulting in a pin five inches out. As you can see, only an eighth inch movement in core shifting moves the CG five inches from the pin. So in this definition, pin position refers to the pin location in relation to the label area or CG. The basic purpose of pin in and pin out balls is to give the experienced driller more options when wanting to change the reaction of a ball. Now when speaking of pin position relative to the center of grip, simply put, it's the location of the pin in relation to the gripping holes. By changing the pin location, you can greatly influence the roll pattern of a ball. For example, the pin in this ball is closer to the center of grip. This ball will go much longer than this ball, where the pin is almost five inches from the center of grip. We will discuss this in more detail as we go through the 10 different drilling patterns. Last, and the least important of the five factors, is the static weights of a bowling ball. Simply put, static weights are what the ball weighs out after drilling. The chart I have here shows a ball divided in four sections. If the center of gravity of the ball falls in quadrant one, the ball will weigh out with the static weights of finger and positive. If the CG falls in quadrant two, the ball will weigh out with thumb and positive. Quadrant three, thumb and negative, and finger and negative in quadrant four. It must be noted, this chart is for right-handers and must be reversed for left-handers. It is important to understand, as far as changing ball reaction goes, static weights are very much secondary to pin positioning. So I will only briefly touch on this as we go through the 10 different drilling patterns. Now that I've gone through these five factors, I would like to give you my estimate of just how important each one is. Here you can see in this pie chart I have put the biggest percentage on what I feel has the greatest effect on ball reaction. Cover stock and ball surface being 70%, core configuration and pin positioning are 25%, and only 5% on static weight. Keep this in mind when drilling your next ball. I have here the six balls we'll be using in the drilling patterns. Let's talk about the general characteristics of each ball. First, we have the Shadow R. It's a three-piece ball with a reactive cover stock. Having a high center of gravity, this ball is the best choice when bowling on lanes that are hooking early. The pancake weight block takes the ball through the first part of the lane, allowing the ball to have more energy to hook on the back end. Notice how the ball goes long, resulting in a later and stronger break. Next we have the Beast, a two-piece ball with reactive cover stock. In comparison to other two-piece balls, the Beast goes longer, which in turn allows it to hook sharper on the back end. Notice how this ball hooks through the oil down the lane. The Piranha is a modified two-piece ball with reactive cover stock. This ball has the most flare potential out of any ball in our line, resulting in its being at its best on oily lanes. Its roll pattern, however, fits in between the beast and the power torque. Watch how it hooks even on this heavily oiled lane. The power torque, like the beast, is a two-piece ball with reactive cover stock. 
However, its rounder shaped core produces an earlier roll. It is the most stable rolling ball in our line. As a result, it has minimal flare, producing a very even arc on most conditions. It's best when the heads are oily and the back ends are dry. Next, we have the Blue Beast, a two-piece ball with non-reactive cover stock. Its inverted bulb-shaped core gives it a high flare potential, resulting in more hook down the lane, as compared to other non-reactive balls. It is best suited for wet, dry conditions with a light concentration of oil in the middle of the lane. Notice how it doesn't overreact to the dry boards when going outside the second arrow. And finally, we have the Stingray, which is a modified two-piece ball. As you can see, the core is similar to our Piranha, but inverted. It also has a non-reactive cover stock. It has a higher flare potential than the Blue Beast, making it better on heavier oil. Its ideal condition is also a wet-dry with heavy concentration of oil in the middle of the lane. Notice how this ball rolls when Marshall gets it in the heavy oil. I hope this brief description of these six balls will give you a better understanding of why I chose the balls I did in each of the ten drilling patterns. As I mentioned earlier, it is always best when laying out a ball to use the bowler's axis point as a reference. This point is an indicator of how the bowler releases the ball. So let me show you an easy way to locate an axis point. First, I'm going to take one of Marshall's old balls, preferably one drilled on the label, and trace a track with a grease pencil all the way around the ball. Then, place the ball on a spinner so the track is even all the way around the bottom of the ball spinner. Turn the spinner on and mark the top of the ball as it's spinning. That mark is the location of the axis point. To measure where this point is on the ball, use a quarter scale. Draw a line through the center of grip and then another line perpendicular to that through the center of grip. It is important to keep these lines at a 90 degree angle from one another. Draw another line through the center of the axis point and the line from the center of grip. Now measure the distance from the center of grip and the lines intersected by the axis point. Then measure the distance up from the line coming from the center of grip. These are the horizontal and vertical measurements of the axis point. As you can see, Marshall's axis point is 5 and 7 eighths over and 1 inch up. Another way of locating an axis point is by placing a piece of tape in the approximate area you believe the axis will be. Have the bowler throw the ball and move the tape until it trues up off his hand. Notice how when Marshall throws the ball, the tape does not wobble until partway down the lane. Once the tape begins to wobble, that is an indicator of the ball beginning to react to the lane. Seeing how the axis point is an indicator of a bowler's release, it is important to use the point right after the release. I hope this has given you a better understanding of what an axis point is and how to find it. Before I get into the 10 drawing patterns, let me emphasize one point. To accurately lay out a ball, the first thing you need to do is to locate the CG, or the center of gravity of the ball. This is also known as a heavy spot. The CG is marked at the factory by a small pinprick. It is located in the Columbia label. Although Columbia's quality assurance team takes great care in accurately marking the CG, it is always best to double check this mark by zeroing out the ball on a dodo scale. As I lay out each pattern, take notice of how I'm using this quarter scale. If the quarter scale is used properly, laying out even the most exotic weights can be a snap. Now I'm going to take you through each of the 10 drawing patterns. I've selected these patterns to give you the ultimate and complete arsenal. Please observe the lane graphic in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. For this drawing, select a shadow R with 3.5 ounces top weight and a pin ranging from zero to one inches out. I'm gonna begin with drawing pattern number one, shadow R, half positive, on label. On label is defined as any drawing that doesn't require an extra hole. So I'm gonna estimate where I feel half positive is gonna be on this ball. Should be a pretty good guess because we've already located where the CG is previously. Turn the ball 180 degrees. See how close my estimate is? 
Okay, that's about three eighths positive. So I'm going to move it over another eighth of an inch. And that's going to be real close to half positive. That'll be the center line for our grip. And this drilling doesn't require any finger or thumb weight. So I just simply need to locate the center of the grip for the finger and thumb, which again, we've already located CG, so this should be pretty accurate. And it's right on. So this is the center of grip for our first drilling, half positive on the label. For this drilling, select the piece with a top weight of three ounces and a pin ranging from zero to one inch out. This is drilling pattern number two. It's similar to the Shadow R layout, but it's a beast. It's also half positive on the label with no finger or thumb weight. Again, I'm going to estimate where I feel half positive is going to be in this ball. And turn it 180 degrees to check that estimate. Okay, in this case, I've got about 9 16 positive. So I simply have to go back about a 16th of an inch. And that'll give us a center line for the grip. And there's no finger or thumb weight in this drilling. So we need to double check the CG for finger and thumb. And that balances out real nice. So this is our center of grip for the second pattern, half positive on the label. Let's look at an example of a spinner's leverage point and a three-quarter roller's leverage point. Leverage weight is simply placing the pin three and three-eighths inches from your axis point. This positions the weight block approximately halfway in between the bowler's track and their axis of rotation. Notice here, in leverage weight for a spinner, the pin is positioned close to the center of grip. Let's say, for example, this axis point is four and a half inches over and two inches up which is a common axis point for a spinner. For leverage weight, you would position the pin three and three eighths inches from the axis. That would leave you only a one and one eighth inch pin shift from the center of grip because four and a half inches minus three and three eighths inches is one and one eighth inch. Now let's take a three quarter roller. Notice the different position the pin is in for leverage weight. Here, using Marshall's axis point as an example, you can see after positioning the pin three and three eighths inches from his axis, this leaves us with a pin shift of two and a half inches from the grip center. Five and seven eighths minus three and three eighths inches equals two and a half inches. This is just one example of showing you why you should use a bower's axis point as a reference when drawing their equipment. Now that we've defined leverage weight, let's move on to drilling number three. For this drilling, select the beast with a top weight of 3.5 ounces and a pin ranging from zero to one inch out. This pattern requires a pin in ball. If you can't find a ball that the pin is directly in the center of the CG, simply place the pin at 12 o'clock in relation to the center of gravity. This will keep the center of gravity and the pin the same distance from the track after the ball has been laid out. Okay, we're gonna go from the CG three and three eighths inches in this direction. This is where we're gonna place Marshall's axis point. His axis is five and seven eighths over. So three and three eighths from five and seven eighths inches is two and a half inches. So his label shift would be two and a half inches in this direction. This will be the mark for his center of grip. We're keeping all the lines at a 90 degree angle with a quarter scale. His finger and thumb will be located in this area. Now we need to place an extra hole in this ball, being leverage weight, and the extra hole is gonna go on his axis. Five and seven eighths over. So we're simply gonna take five and seven eighths over, and his axis is one inch up. So we're simply gonna take quarter scale on a 90 degree angle, measure one inch up, 
and that's the location for his extra hole. That's what leverage weight looks like. Now we need to place the extra hole in this ball. Well, you may ask, how do you know how much weight to take out of the ball to get it to half positive? Well, we need to weigh the ball up to see how much side weight it has from this point. Turn the ball 180 degrees. And at this point, the ball has one and three quarters positive side. Now we want to take this ball to a half positive. To do this, we need to remove an ounce and a quarter from this point. Seven eighths, two and a half inches will remove an ounce and a quarter of side weight. Or choose the bit that you like to remove an ounce and a quarter. So this is drilling pattern number three, positive leverage in a beast. It must be noted that Marshall's grip holes add finger weight because the finger holes remove less weight than the thumb hole. For this reason, when laying out leverage weight for Marshall, it is not necessary to add thumb weight because the placement of his axis hole removes the excess finger weight. If Marshall's grip holes didn't add finger weight, the proper move to place the extra hole would not be a one inch move up, but only a half inch move up with the extra hole, and the other half inch move would be with a center of grip. That would add a little finger weight, and as a result, the extra hole would remove this finger weight, making the ball weigh out pretty close to zero. For this drawing, select a piranha with three ounces top weight and a pin ranging from zero to one inch out. This is drawing pattern number four, a piranha with leverage weight, half positive. So you can see this ball, the pin is directly in the center of gravity. So we don't need to turn the pin to 12 o'clock. We previously determined where the CG is. So we can simply take a line and go 3 and 3 eighths from the pin. That'll be his positive axis. And then come back 5 and 7 eighths inches or 2 and a half inches from the pin. Again, his axis point is 5 and 7 eighths inches. So two and a half inches from the pin is this point. This is going to be where the holes go. And we need to move the up movement on his axis point to put the extra hole. One inch up. It's the placement of the extra hole. Okay, now we need to take this ball to the scale to see how much positive side we have to remove to get this ball to half positive. Returning the small balance to zero. Balance the ball out. Turn it 180 degrees. And this will tell us how much side is in the ball right now. This ball started with a lower top weight than the beast in drawing pattern number three. As a result, it's got less positive side weighs out with one and a quarter ounce positive side from this point. So we need to remove three quarters positive side to get it to half positive. A three quarter bit, two and a half inches deep, will remove three quarter positive side. So that's the drilling pattern number four, positive leverage in the piranha. For this drilling, select a piranha with 2.5 ounces top weight and a pin ranging from one to two inches out. This is drilling pattern number five. This is the ball that will give your customer the most hook. I call it a one inch pass leverage with a nine inch hole. We're gonna place the pin at 12 o'clock in relation to the center of gravity. We're then gonna draw another line through the center of gravity all the way around the ball. Now to place the pin one inch past the leverage point, instead of going three and three eighths towards the positive axis, I'm gonna go two and three eighths inches towards the positive axis point. This would be approximately where Marshall Holman's axis is if we were to put a hole here. Now we're gonna go back five and seven eighths inches from this point to locate a center of grip. One, two, three, four, five, and seven eighths. This is the location of his grip center. This places the pin 
one inch past his leverage point. Now placing the extra hole nine inches, nine inches from the center of grip, we're going to draw a line a little bit past the axis point, and we're simply going to measure from the center of grip nine inches around the ball. At this point, we will drill the extra hole to get this ball back to half positive. This ball, you'll notice, has quite a bit of flare. As a result, it'll be necessary, necessary to place the pin in this position to keep the ball from rolling over the finger holes. I'll discuss this a little bit later as we go through certain drilling patterns. Now let's take this ball to the scale. Now we need to weigh this ball to see how much side weight we need to remove to get it to half positive. Seeing how it's a nine inch hole, we'll have to remove more weight than we would if it was a six and three quarters or say a hole on your axis point. A good ratio to use for a nine inch hole is simply add 25% to what you would normally remove from a hole on the side of the ball. In this case, the ball weighs out with two and a quarter positive side. To get it to a half positive with a hole on the side of the ball, you'd have to remove one and three quarter ounces of positive. Seeing how it's a nine inch, nine inch hole, we'll have to remove 25% above one and three quarter ounces, which is approximately two and a quarter ounces of positive side. To remove two and a quarter ounces of side from this point, I'm going to take an inch and a quarter bit and go two and a quarter inches deep. That should get us pretty close, but always recheck the ball after you place an extra hole, just to make sure you're within parameters. So this is a piranha, one inch past leverage with a nine inch extra hole. For this drilling, select the power torque with a top weight of 2.5 ounces and a pin ranging from zero to one inch out. Now for drilling pattern number six. Call this drilling half negative leverage. We're gonna use a power torque. A lot of people get confused on what half negative leverage actually is, or any kind of negative leverage. Negative leverage is simply positive leverage drilled back to negative static weights. So the layout is very similar to a positive leverage weighted ball. So you can see this pin is slightly out of CG, so we're gonna place it at 12 o'clock in relation to the center of gravity to keep the pin and the center of gravity the same distance from the track after the ball is drilled. We're gonna draw a line, as we did with positive leverage balls, through the center of gravity, go three and three-eighths to the axis, and then back two and a half inches for the center of grip. Again, this distance is five and seven-eighths, which is Marshall Holman's axis. This is where we're gonna place the center of grip. Now we need to move a one-inch up movement for the extra hole. And this is the location for the extra hole. This is the layout for half negative leverage. Now we need to take the ball to the scale and weigh the ball out, see how much positive side it has, and simply remove that positive side till it weighs out to half negative. Flipping the ball 180 degrees. This ball now has one and a half positive side. To get this ball to a half negative, we need to remove two ounces of side weight. Two ounces of side weight can be removed with an inch and an eighth bit, two and a half inches deep. And there you have negative leverage. For this drilling, select a piranha with 2.5 ounces of top weight or less and a pin ranging from three to three and a half inches. Drilling number seven is what I call axis leverage. It's simply placing the static center or center of gravity on your axis point and placing the pin around the area of your leverage point. To accomplish this, we're gonna draw a line through the center of gravity and through the pin and from this point, we're gonna go down one inch from the center of gravity. This is our vertical movement for Marshall Holman's axis point of one inch. 
From this point, we're going to draw another line through the pin towards the center of grip. This places the pin at 3 o'clock in relation to the center of grip. So we're going to go 5 and 7 eighths inches. And this places the static center or center of gravity on his axis point. And it's important that you keep the lines at a 90 degree angle using the quarter scale. You don't want to you don't want to do this. You want to keep it on this line, a 90 degree line. Draw your line for center grip. And this is what axis leverage looks like. Now we need to remove quite a bit of weight from this, from this point, seeing how most of the top weight is to the side of the ball. Now we need to take the ball to the scale and check it for positive side. As you notice, I recommend starting with two and a half ounces of top weight or less. The lower the top weight you can use in this drilling, the better off you'll be, simply because you'll have to remove less weight from the side of the ball to make the ball legal or to give it to a half positive, whatever the case may be. And this ball, we're taking it to a half positive. The ball right now has two and three eighths positive side because we started with two and a half ounces top. So to remove one and seven eighths side from this point, we're going to take an inch and an eighth bit and go two and a half inches deep. Should get you real close to half side. This is axis leverage. For this drilling, select a power torque with 2.5 ounces of top weight or less and a pin ranging from zero to one inch. This is drilling number eight. It's a power torque with a pin on the axis. This requires a pin located close to the center of gravity. As you can see, this pin is about an inch from the center of gravity. So we want to keep the CG closer to the center of grip. You can do this by drawing a line through the pin and measuring down one inch, which is Marshall Holman's vertical movement, then drawing another line on a 90 degree angle from that point through the center of gravity and measure 5 and 7 eighths inches, which is Marshall Holman's horizontal movement for his axis point. And this will be our center of grip to place the pin directly on his axis. Now to locate the extra hole, which is eight inches around from the center of grip, simply measure from the center of grip eight inches. And that's the location of the extra hole. Now let's take this ball to the scale. Again, we're drawing the extra hole below six and three quarters. So it's going to require a little extra weight to be removed from this point. Seeing how we added 25% for the nine inch hole, this is an eight inch hole. So I'm going to add about 20% to the weight that needs to be removed to get this ball to have positive. This ball weighs out with two ounces of side. So to get this ball to half positive, I'd have to remove an ounce and a half with a six and three quarters hole or a hole on his axis. But to remove the weight with an eight inch hole, I'll have to remove about, say, one and three quarter positive ounce. To remove one and three quarters from this point, I draw an inch and a sixteenth bit, two and a half inches deep. That should get you pretty close. We'll drill the ball and then check it on the scale to make sure it's around a half positive. This is pin on the axis, eight inch hole. For this drawing, select the blue beast with a top weight of three ounces and a pin ranging from zero to one inch out. This is drawing pattern number nine. It's our non-reactive blue beast. 
It's a half positive unlabeled drilling. Again, we're estimating where I feel half positive should be. And hopefully that's close enough so we won't have to double check it. Turn the ball 180 degrees. In this case, it's only got a quarter positive in this point. So I'm going to move over another quarter of an inch and see if that's closer to half positive. Rebalance the scale. Turn the ball 180 degrees. And that should be real close. It's right on half positive. Okay, there's no finger or thumb weight in this drilling. So the center of, gri center of grip should be right in this location. Okay, that's zero. So we have a half positive, zero finger or thumb, and drilling pattern number nine. For this drawing, select a stingray with three ounces top weight and a pin ranging from zero to one inch out. And this is the last of the drawing patterns, number 10, stingray with a half positive leverage. Requiring a pin in ball, this one is slightly away from CG, so we're going to place the pin at 12 o'clock in relation to the center of gravity. Draw a line through the center of gravity three and three-eighths towards the axis, and then back two and a half inches for the grip center. Draw your line for the center of grip, fingers and thumb, and the extra hole will move up one inch from this point. That's the location of the extra hole, which is on his axis. We'll take this ball to the scale. We'll weigh the ball out to see how much side weight it has now. And remove that weight to get the ball to a half positive. Looks like we have about one and a half side. So we're going to move one ounce from this point, which in this case, a 7 8 bit, two inches deep, will remove one ounce of side weight. This is a Stingray, half positive leverage. As we went through the layout of drilling pattern number five, I mentioned that this ball has a very high flare potential. For this reason, I selected a pin out ball and place the pin at 12 o'clock in relation to the center of gravity. As you can see in the diagram here, when this ball flares, to keep it from flaring over the finger holes, the pin must be up in relation to the center of grip. To find out where the bow tie is or where the smallest flare point is in a track, draw an imaginary line through the axis point and through the pin crossing the track. This is where the bow tie or the flare will start. The first revolution will be in this area and as the ball begins to flare it will cross through this point. As the ball rolls down the lane you can see it will never roll over the finger holes as a result of the pin being up above the center grip. Now let's take for example placing the pin around three o'clock. If you were to do this in a drawing that had a high flare potential, draw a line through the positive axis point and through the pin. At this point is where the bow tie would be. The first revolution would be in this area. And as the ball traveled down the lane, as you can see it's rolling over the finger holes. So obviously this isn't what we want. When drawing a ball for a customer, the last thing they want to see is to throw the ball down the lane and hear it hitting any finger holes. 
So when drilling a bottle that has a high flare potential, always keep the pin above two o'clock from the center of grip. This will keep the track from coming across the finger holes. You may have noticed none of the 10 patterns called for any finger or thumb weight. This is because similar results can be obtained by changing the distance between the pin and the center of grip. To further explain this, take a look at this chart. Let's say, for example, you're using a leverage weighted ball on a particular condition. And on this condition, leverage weight gave you the best reaction. If you were to take a ball and draw it with a pin closer to the center of grip, but all other factors being equal, such as weights and surface, this ball in the same condition would go further down the lane before it began to hook, resulting in a later break point. In short, as stated here, the closer the pin is to the center of grip, the longer the ball will go. On the other hand, if you were to take a ball and draw it with a pin farther from the grip center and closer to the axis point, it would go into a roll sooner, resulting in an earlier hook and earlier break point. As stated here, the farther the pin is from the center of grip, the earlier the ball will get into a roll, resulting in an earlier break point. Out of all the information in this video, I believe this is the most important aspect of drilling a ball. If you understand and use this information correctly, you'll be pleased with the results. For this sequence, it must be noted that all the outer surfaces of the 10 balls were left with their out-of-the-box finish. Now let's take bowling great Marshall Holman to the lanes with the arsenal we've created. Here we have the shadow R on a condition where the heads hook. Marshall can line up with his feet much further right with this ball than any other ball, increasing his angle of entry, which results in more striking power. The piranha with leverage weight, remaining in the same lineup position, hooks early and hits high. This ball on layout simply needs more oil in the heads and pines. Now watch the axis leverage piranha. Even trying to move slightly left, the ball has no chance of getting down the lane. As you can see, it hooks early and goes Brooklyn. Now take a look at the beast. Same layout, half positive on label. As you can see, it's closer but the two-piece core makes this ball hook a little too early, resulting in a high hit. Here's a condition with a little more oil in the heads. Drawing the beast on label influences the ball to glide through the heads, producing a strong back-end reaction. On-label drillings and higher top weights are ideal on conditions where the heads hook. Now notice the reaction of the piranha with a 9-inch hole. Being at its best on a much oilier lane, this ball hooks much too soon and crosses over. So keep this ball in the bag until you're bowling on a tighter condition. Here's the power torque with the pin on the axis. This ball is designed to roll very early, resulting in a smooth back end reaction. Notice how it hooks before it even gets to the arrows. This is clearly not enough oil for this ball. Now we have the beast with positive leverage. I selected a higher top in this ball simply to make the ball go longer and hook harder on the back end. Even with the heavier concentration of oil down the lane, this ball still recovers nicely. Now watch this reaction closely. The power torque rolls soon and rolls up to the pocket, but doesn't have the energy left to hit like the beast. This is why this ball is best suited for drier back ends. Let's watch the pin on the axis torque. This lane lacking the head oil this ball needs to get down the lane, this ball hooks way too early. Here we have a beast, but drilled on label. This drilling simply takes the ball too far down the lane. It tries to recover, but doesn't have enough time to get to the pocket. Here we have the leverage weighted piranha with a bit more oil. Marshall has to play a little further right with this ball, but it gives him the best reaction overall in comparison to the other nine balls tried. Now watch the beast with positive leverage. 
Although it should be closer on this condition, there's just a little too much oil in the pines, keeping this ball from recovering in time to hit the pocket, justifying the fact that the core in the beast takes it further down the lane than the piranha. Now watch the axis leverage piranha. Drilled the hook sooner than positive leverage, it starts to hook as soon as it gets to the pine area. This ball simply needs more oil in the heads and pines to react properly. Now we have the heaviest oiled lane of them all. This ball suits this condition perfectly. Keep in mind, this ball has the most flare, explaining why it hooks so well in the heavy oil. This ball has no chance on this much oil. Notice how the shadow R crosses the arrows at the same point, but never attempts to hook in the pine or back end. The Stingray, being suited for heavy oil, has a better chance. But once it gets to the back ends, there's not near enough dry boards to allow this ball to hook to the pocket. It tries to hook and then seems just to pick up speed. Let's take a look at the power torque with negative leverage. As you can see, this ball is designed for an oily lane with dry back ends. Watch how smooth and even it reacts down the lane, even though it has a reactive cover stock. Now watch the piranha. This ball, drilled to roll slightly sooner than the power torque, hooks just a bit too soon on this condition and goes high in the pocket. Although a slight move left would be a good adjustment, save this ball for a little more oil. Now let's take the Shadow R. This is just too much oil for this ball. He even gets it in a little bit and it still just glides past the pocket. Save this ball for when the heads are hooking. Here we have a condition with dry back ends, but heavier oil in the heads. Watch how this piranha rolls heavy through the pine and continues to hook to the pocket. This drawing works well on most oily house conditions. Now notice how the label weighted beast can't quite make the turn in the pine area. This is the result of the ball being drilled on label, which induces skid in the pine. Similar to the Shadow R, use this ball when the heads are hooking. Now let's look at the leverage weight piranha. This ball is designed to go longer and then hook harder than the axis leverage piranha. And that's exactly what it does on this condition. This ball definitely needs more oil down the lane. Now we have a condition with a lot of head and pine oil and very dry back ends. This layout in the torque puts the ball into an early roll, burning energy resulting in an even arc on the back end. Watch the Shadow R, throwing the same shot. It glides through the heads in pine, as a result, has plenty of energy left to overhook in the back end. On this condition, it's best to leave this ball in the bag. Now watch the Piranha. Not drilled to roll very early, this ball wants to hook way too much in the back end. You'll need more oil down the lane for this ball to be effective. Now let's take a look at the Blue Beast. It's a non-reactive cover stock and is best suited for this condition. Even though the outside boards are very dry, watch how it just arcs up to the pocket, not overreacting or snapping through the nose. Now the Shadow R, on the other hand, is drilled to go long and then hook hard on the back end. And that's exactly what it does. As you can see, it goes long, but then has too much energy left and hooks through the nose. Now let's take the Piranha. Not only is it drilled the hook, the cover stock is also just too much when it hits the dry back ends. This ball definitely needs more oil down the lane. The Stingray, on the other hand, may be okay on this condition if Marshall were to move his feet a little deeper. But remaining in the same lineup position, the lighter concentration of oil from 10 to 10 is just not quite enough. Here we have a wet-dry condition with a heavier concentration of oil from 10 to 10. This condition is ideal for this ball because it doesn't react violently to the dry boards, yet will roll through the heavy oil inside 10. Now watch the beast with the reactive cover stock. 
This ball being designed for a lane with tighter back ends overreacts down the lane. Notice the ball goes to the same point down the lane as a stingray, but then overreacts in the back end. Now let's look at the negative leverage torque. Even though it was designed to roll even, the reactive cover stock is still too much when contacting the dry boards. Now he'll throw the blue beast. The ball and weights in the ball being designed to go a little longer than the stingray doesn't quite make it to the pocket. Although moving right with this ball would be a possible adjustment, it is best suited for a little less oil. Boy, what a demonstration. I'm sure as much as you like to sell tin balls to your customers, they probably can't afford it. So what I've done is broken these tin balls into four categories, allowing you to choose one from each category to better prepare your customers for the variety of conditions that they encounter. For example, a possible combination of four balls to start with will be number one, a Shadow R drilled on label. Number four, a Piranha with positive leverage. And then choose number six, a power torque with negative leverage. For the fourth ball, choose one of the non-reactive balls for those conditions when reactives are uncontrollable. How about number nine, the blue beast with a half positive on label. One ball from each of these four categories would make a good beginning arsenal. This should give you a better idea in helping your customers conquer their lane conditions. In summary, let's review some of the key points in this video. We started off with the five most important factors in getting a proper ball reaction. It is very important to keep these in their proper perspective, remembering that cover stock and ball surface are the most influential in altering a ball's reaction. Also remember the general characteristics of the six balls used today, so you can better select the right ball for a particular condition. After selecting the proper ball, Always use the bowler's axis point as a reference when drawing that ball. And follow up that ball with others that will give them that ultimate and complete arsenal they're looking for to conquer any lane condition they encounter. As a pro shop operator, serving your customers is the bottom line. I hope this video has given you a better understanding of every aspect of the ball drilling world. I'm Dave Smart for Columbia 300. Columbia holds the world over.